This is the iMac G3, an iconic piece of tech history, and without this computer, our future could have looked vastly different. The G3 is probably most well known for its design, and to this day is still instantly identifiable. You can't say that about a lot of tech products, and while that is a huge part of what made it special and changed the PC landscape, this machine really paved the way for a lot of tech innovation, and even looking at modern day devices, there's still remnants of this iMac inside of them. Today, I'm gonna get into all of that, I not only want to touch on how the iMac G3 came to be and what made it special, but how it led to the products that we use today and what aspects of it still exist in those products. So if you want to take a trip down memory lane and dive into how we wouldn't have this without this, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. The story of the iMac G3 is an interesting one, and to truly understand what made it so special, we have to go back and look at what was happening during that time period. In the late 90s, Apple was in a huge downward spiral with plummeting computer sales. They'd just gone through multiple CEOs and made a number of layoffs and cost-cutting measures, and it looked like it might be the end of the company, but there were a couple of things that happened in 1996 and 97 that would eventually lead to things turning around. In 1996, Apple decided to purchase Next, the company founded by Steve Jobs, who had previously been fired from Apple in 1985. They bought Next in an attempt to modernize their own operating system, which was riddled with issues, and in doing so, brought Jobs back to Apple as an advisor. It was also around this time that Johnny Ive, who had led the design on a number of Apple products, was thinking about quitting Apple. He was discouraged due to a number of commercial and design failures, but because Jobs was coming back, he was convinced to stay, with his boss telling them that under Steve Jobs, things would change and Apple would make history. Then in July of 1997, Steve Jobs staged a board coup, resulting in the previous CEO, Gil Emilio, being dismissed and Jobs taking over the role in the following months. It was also at this time that Microsoft had been facing a lot of scrutiny for their anti-competitive practices. I don't know how many people remember that whole Internet Explorer monopoly fiasco, but because of that, Microsoft had strategically invested $150 million into Apple, to show that a competitive marketplace existed and try and mitigate some of that antitrust risk. Having that extra capital from Microsoft allowed Apple to move forward on new projects a little easier, and the whole point of this is a lot had to go right at the perfect time just for all the right pieces to fall into place. In the months that followed, Jobs was formally introduced as the CEO. During an initial meeting when this was announced, he criticized Apple's product lineup saying that it was substandard and emphasized that he wanted to prioritize design as a fundamental pillar of Apple's future success and at Macworld announced that they'd be shrinking down their product lineup. Jobs then gave these specifications to Johnny Ives' design team for a brand new machine, an affordable all-in-one computer with a distinctive unique look, and on May 6th, 1998, the iMac was born. This machine looked nothing like the PCs that were available at the time. In the 90s, computers were essentially just grey and beige ugly towers that had no sense of design, and they weren't very welcoming to new or inexperienced users. The iMac, on the other hand, had a ton of thought put into its construction. The colorful appearance was introduced to invoke positive emotion, a recessed handle was added at the back to make it less intimidating for new users and feel a bit more personal. There were holographic labels added and obviously the translucent shell. The cost of the casing alone was three times that of your average computer case at the time. And because it was translucent, that also meant that all the internals had to be designed in a way that looked appealing. But this wasn't just all about looks. This was the first computer that did away with old legacy standards like serial ports and floppy drives and only had USB ports and a CD drive for data transfer and external peripherals. Keep in mind, this was when USB was in its infancy and this was the first mainstream computer to use and completely move to USB. And without the iMac, who knows if it would have ever caught on in the same way that it did. This was also at a time when the internet was in its early stages. I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the I in iMac stands for internet, and the iMac was marketed as being internet ready out of the box with a built-in 56K modem and ethernet. So this was a truly revolutionary all-in-one computer for the time, and it became an instant hit. The iMac G3 sold over 270,000 units in its first six weeks and 800,000 after its first 20. Apple went from losing 
$878 million in 1997 to turning a profit the following year, which is pretty incredible. That allowed Apple to develop new products and iterate on the iMac as well. The G3 that I have here is the 233 MHz Revision B model. That's the second iteration of the original iMac released in October of 1998, which side note, we talk a lot about the process that chips are built on, like an M3 chip is built on a three nanometer process, which signifies the size of the components within the chips. The PowerPC 750 chip that's in this model is 250 nanometers. So the processor in this Mac has components in it that are over 80 times the size of a modern Mac, which is pretty crazy to think about. This Rev B version technically has a higher ceiling for how much RAM you can install in it at 512 megabytes versus 384 in the Rev A models. And it does have an improved graphics card going from two megabytes of video RAM all the way up to a whopping six. The actual RAM that came with both of these versions I think was set at 32 megabytes and generally speaking iMacs at the time weren't all that different from your average PC in performance. With that being said there's one thing from a technical standpoint that we really have to talk about and that's in the software. Remember earlier when I said that Apple had originally bought Next to modernize its own operating system? Well, the success of the iMac not only allowed Apple to make new hardware, but new software as well. This particular iMac released with Mac OS 8 and was later upgradable to Mac OS 9, which this machine currently runs. And while OS 8 and 9 would still run on mostly older technology without the influence of Next Step, the operating system Next computers use, there were some notable introductions that may sound familiar. Some of you may have heard of Keychain Access, a password management system that stores passwords for websites and network resources. That first showed up on Mac OS 9. Something called Sherlock was put into a later version of Mac OS 8 shortly after the iMac was released, while Sherlock 2 was on OS 9. That tool allowed you to search both your local machine and the internet simultaneously. If that sounds familiar, that's probably because it was replaced by something called Spotlight Search in 2005, a feature that many of us now use every day. Those features, amongst others, eventually made their way into Mac OS X, which was the first operating system that was based on Next Step. Now, that had been in the works since 1998, and the G3 iMac would be one of the first computers it was designed to run on. OS X has seen many upgrades over the years, and in 2016, the name was changed from OS X to Mac OS. Now, you might still hear people say OS X, but even now, the fundamental design and functionality remains largely the same. iOS is spun off from OS X and shares a lot of the same foundational code and structure. And funny enough, if you go look at a lot of modern iOS and Mac apps to this day, you'll see data types prefixed with NS, like NS string or NS number. The NS actually stands for next step, which to have an old piece of tech history still in our modern devices is kind of cool. There are just so many things that first showed up and springboarded from the iMac G3. Without it, who knows if we'd even have USB or Thunderbolt in the same way that we do now. And if it wasn't a success, we wouldn't have the iPod or the iPhone. And maybe we'd still be surfing the web on Blackberries with trackballs. I think the design of the original iMac is timeless and it still inspires some new products that we see today, like this Spigen C1 case. There's a lot of texture and color that we just don't see in Apple products anymore. And I would love to see Apple come out with some kind of classic model like a MacBook or maybe even the iMac with a translucent design in this Bondi blue color. Since I picked up this iMac, almost everyone that I've shown or talked to seems to either remember owning one of these or knew friends who did or where they first used one, which I don't think that you can really say about a lot of products. For me, I never actually owned one of these until now, but I did have a few friends who did and it felt like such a different experience using one of these versus a PC at the time. And I would love to hear from all of you. Did you ever own one of these Macs or maybe an iBook or something similar? Drop a comment down below and let me know because I'm really interested to hear other people's stories on this stuff. Uh, I just love old tech. I know this is something new to the channel, but I've honestly been really interested in the history behind tech my whole life. So if you guys enjoyed this video, let me know and give it a like and I'll try and find some more gear like this. That is it for me today. If you would like to see more tech-related content or start calling iMacs and iPhones, internet Macs and internet phones, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next upload.